Happy Thursday, everybody. Welcome in to GC Live Afternoon Drive. It is November 2nd, 2023, and the Gamecocks are gearing up to take on Jacksonville State this weekend, looking to get back into the win column. It's been quite some time since South Carolina won a game. It's also been quite some time since USC's defense has forced a turnover to go all the way back to September 30th, the final last time the Gamecocks were able to do that defensively. That was the second quarter against Tennessee. But, of course, it's been even longer since South Carolina won a game. Now, Justin Thomas says, we here for the GOAT talk. Yes, that's right. Marcus Lattimore will be joining us momentarily. Just waiting for Marcus to hop on. But uh, in the meantime, as we do every week, we'll get into the keys of the game. I'll keep this a little bit shorter because Mar Marcus is three hours behind us. He's on the West Coast. But he'll be joining us just any minute now. and. Uh, Again, as we do every week, we'll lead off with the keys, but I'll try to keep it a little bit tighter today, not knowing exactly when Marcus will hop on with us. But let's get right into it. Uh, number one for USC this week, and they have to force turnovers. I mean, as I mentioned, they haven't been able to force a turnover since September 30th. That was in the second quarter against Tennessee. Last week, and I liked a lot of things that they did early in the game, the 3-3-5 look, it provided more speed. Uh, we saw how they were able to capitalize and take advantage of an Aggie's D as an, an Aggie's offense that wasn't ready for that. Right. And then they made the adjustments as the game went on, but USC was able to pick up three sacks through the first 11 plays. If you're able to continue to do that, we talk about how, you know, maybe this defense looks a little gas towards the end of the game. Some of that has to do with the simple fact that they're not being able to get off the field. 72 snaps last week that defense faced, but when you're able to create turnovers, that's not going to, allow the offense to continue to extend the drives that we've seen. I mean, A&M last week, when you look at it from a statistical standpoint, we're talking about third down conversions. It might not have seemed as bad as it really was because some of those third down conversions or lack thereof, it set them up for manageable fourth down situations and they were able to capitalize off of them. Um, number two, create tackles for a loss on first and second down. You need to be able to get this offense to be able to play behind the sticks, right? When we're talking about the defense, trying to help them out a little bit more, getting off the field, the higher percent of chances to be able to create a turnover, right? From an interception standpoint, it goes up. It goes up if the offense, if the opposition is playing behind the sticks early on. So, again, continue to get after Jacksonville State this weekend by doing some of the things you were able to do early in the game last week against Texas A&M. Uh, number three, and I wrote about him yesterday, and we'll talk a little bit about him with Marcus in a little bit. Just get Mario Anderson the ball early and often. He's a guy that obviously has continued to grow. We heard Dal Loggins talk about him yesterday. He's doing things where it's not just being a great ball carrier. He's doing good things as a blocker, too. His pass protection, it has continued to get better. His vision at this level, understanding the speed of the game, understanding the other assignments that maybe at Newberry and just at the Division II level, it's not necessarily going to be the same. I mean, Shane Beamer talked about it a couple weeks ago, and Carlin Patel, former Gamecock defensive back, who made the jump up from Division II. He played corner, of course, played nickel at South Carolina. He mentioned that at the Division II level, there would only be really maybe one dude that you'd have to really focus on each week. Next level, right, playing here in the SEC, you're going to have dudes across the board. And that's kind of similar in the sense of what Mario Anderson has had to face from a pass protection standpoint. Maybe there's only one edge guy that you have to worry about or an outside linebacker. But now you really have to have your head on a swivel when you're back out there from a pass protection standpoint in the SEC. So get him involved because by doing that, it's going to keep Jacksonville State honest. Hopefully, it'll force them to bring down an extra defender in the box, whether that be a safety, whether that be an extra linebacker, and that will open up some of the passing lanes so that Spencer Rattler can get things going through the air. Because as we've seen in a small sample size, but with USC playing at home this season, only three games, they're averaging 41.7 points per game. It's been much different on the road. But when you're averaging just shy of 42 points at home, being able to play these final four games, 
I mean, that's massive, but especially this game in particular, because I think this game, outside of the obvious of getting a win, you need to be able to get the confidence. You need to get the confidence going. I know some people, and I'm in, I'm in there too. I mean, we talk about bowl eligibility just because it's a talking point uh, for the sake of conversation, but none of that matters if you don't go out there and not just win this weekend, but win in a way where you're looking at certain elements, right? The defense. Okay, hey, the defense, they were able to do this better in comparison to what we've seen over the last couple of weeks. Hey, the offensive line, which hopefully we'll have Vershawn Lee back out there at right tackle this weekend. Hey, they were able to do this better. This should make you feel better moving forward down the stretch. So, again, if you want to take a look at that over on Gamecock Central, you can see that there. i give you a little bit more detail as to why I feel like those are the three keys that you need this weekend. Uh, as we wait for Marcus, because I told Marcus, I said, Marcus, just hop on whenever you get a chance in that two o'clock wind in that two o'clock hour. So he'll uh, be joining whenever he's good to go. We'll have him for about 15, 20 minutes or so. In the meantime, if you guys have any questions or thoughts, comments, anything about the Gamecocks this weekend, let us know. Tower from Spartanburg. That had a lot of fun this weekend, huh? Gotta love the cotton gin continuing their signs. Had a nice one in response to that. Uh, but let us know. Let us know what you guys think about this weekend's game. And once Marcus hops on, we will open up the floodgates, too. If you guys have any questions for Marcus, it's been quite some time since Marcus has talked about the Gamecocks publicly. I know some of you, whether it be on the message board or be on Twitter, asked, you know, what happened to the Believe podcast that you did with Marcus? Well, Marcus has had a lot of things going on. He's been juggling a lot, and uh, unfortunately, the timing doesn't always work up. Work out. Uh, would love to be able to get the show up and running again in the near future, but um, right now it's just not happening. That's all right because again, we have Marcus today talking about the Gamecocks in just a little bit. Zachary Robinson says, "Excited for the game this weekend. We haven't lost every time my wife's been in attendance, so I'm dragging her along Saturday." Number one, Zach, that is commitment starting with you okay i mean we can give credit to your wife for going but it, it's the commitment of you bringing her that's where it starts so zach's doing his part still Curtin says what's up y'all excited to have the gamecock legend marcus Lattimore with us today me too you know marcus and i we've developed a good relationship over the over the years you know when i was at watch fox and he always he always uh blows my mind away with just the way he thinks. He thinks differently. Um, he thinks differently. And it makes you think. He's one of those people. You know, there's there's few people, I'm sure, that in your lives, regardless of who you are, regardless of the profession, that you can think of a person or two that thinks that way. Uh, they get you to think differently. Justin says, I'd like for us to control this game completely. Yeah. And when you say completely, Justin, I'm glad you, you, you worded it the way you did. It's not just about the defense looking cleaner this week. It's not just about the offense. It's all three phases. All three phases. I mean, we look back to last week's game against Texas A&M. I mentioned the, on Tuesday, I mentioned the two rough punts that USC had, but on top of that, they also had the kick-catch interference. So USC's defense was already dealing with having to play defense in a short yardage situation, right? Short field because A&M got the ball in plus territory, I think once or twice. And then the other one was uh, just around midfield, but they were all right, right around midfield. There was another situation too in the first quarter where USC had a beautiful punt. Kai Kroger had a beautiful punt inside the five. And unfortunately they weren't able to down it. You know, went into the end zone. So just little things like that from a special team standpoint, because when we sit here, we talk about, the defense, and we want to talk about, you know, the offense being able to get into rhythm. I mean, shoot, yes, USC, they've done it twice this year. I think it was actually back-to-back -back drives against Mississippi State where they scored the two longest drives in the Shane Beamer era, which was a 97-yard drive, and then the next drive they scored a 98-yard drive for a touchdown. So, yes, I understand they've had success with scoring when they've been backed up in their end zone, but – Competition's going to continue to get better. Uh, and that's no disrespect against Mississippi State. And, you know, I'm not saying that means Jacksonville State's better.
But uh, the point being is down this stretch, you, you certainly don't want to be playing from the shadow of your own end zone offensively. Um, let's see what else we got here. Steel Curtain says, yeah, Zach, let's keep the undefeated streak going. Hip Hop Madness 803 says, Gamecocks versus Gamecocks. Got to love college football. No doubt the team will be ready uh, one game at a time. They have to. That's the that's that's the mentality they certainly need to keep. That they understand that they have to win out if they want to become ball eligible. But at the same time, too, none of that matters if you lose this weekend. If you lose next weekend, right? So you just got to worry about this weekend's game. And I know it sounds like coach talk. It sounds real cliche to say, but it's the God's honest truth. It's the God's honest truth. Corey says, I would like to see more 21 personnel on offense. And I'm glad you added that, Corey, because some people don't know the football terminology. Not saying all of you, but uh, two running back, one tight end set. We haven't really seen that as much this year, I feel like, with USC. And I think some of it has to do with the issues they've had at the offensive line. You know, we had Perry Orth on earlier this week, and he was talking about how it's not necessarily as simple as just saying, hey, okay, bring in two tight ends or, hey, bring in two running backs in the backfield, right? And that will alleviate the issues that you're having on the offensive line because when you do that, what happens? Well, you're bringing more bodies into the box, and from a defensive standpoint, that means they're going to bring more bodies into the box. So I think more than anything, if USC is able to get things going, consistently with their offensive line starting this weekend, especially if Vershawn Lee is back in the lineup at right tackle, who is questionable as of today. We'll find out possibly tonight. Shane Beamer will be at Carolina Calls, Backstreet Grill at 6 o'clock. You can listen live on 107.5 The Game. But if he is back in the lineup this weekend and you're able to get the offensive line back into a position where we saw it a couple weeks ago against Florida, then, yeah, you can be able to throw some more wrinkles into the offense. Because I feel like it's been more so kind of like a chess match for Dow Loggins. He's had to move pieces around based on what's been going on with the injury bug that they've been facing all season. So I, I think, unfortunately, we haven't seen what this offense will truly look like these next couple of years. Now, certainly you'll be likely, and I say likely, uh, because – I said last year there was no shot that Rattler would be coming back. I still think it's very, very slim to none that he's coming back. But it's likely that Rattler is not going to be back. Very likely that he's not going to be back next year. So you're going to have to figure out how you move on from that. But um, I think Dow has done a good job of being able to roll with the punches as far as some of these injuries go on the offensive line. Again, if you're just joining us, Marcus Lattimore, Lattimore will be joining us in a little bit. Going to let him know. We're good to go on him. And he'll be in here to talk about some Gamecock football. Also relive some of those memories from those 2010, 2013 teams during that span. No, he wasn't here in 13, but point being is he was a big part of one of the best errors in Gamecock football on this weekend. Those teams will be honored at williams Bryce Stadium. Steve Spurrier will also be in attendance as well. So we'll hear from Marcus. But Marcus will be in town next weekend in Columbia. He'll have an opportunity if you want to meet him, talk with him, take some photos, autographs, all that fun stuff. He'll be announcing that on our program in just a little bit when he's good to go. What else we got here in the meantime as we wait for Marcus to join us? Steel Curtain says Kai Kroger has to be better punting the ball in November. Not sure what's been going on, but he has to be better. I think, again, as I mentioned last week, there were things that Kai did that were good, but there were also times that he struggled. And I think, you know, for me, I try to look at it from, from you know, a game-to-game -game standpoint. Um, certainly in comparison to what he's been able to accomplish earlier in his career, the standard is much higher for him and the expectation from this fan base. And I'm sure for even Kai himself, he would tell you that he has to play better from a consistency standpoint, but he did do some good things. He did do some good things against 
Texas A&M, as I mentioned, you should have that one punt down inside the five yard line. There's no reason why that wasn't downed. Um, then you have some of the kick catch interference stuff that negates the net total, which as Beamer mentioned on Sunday, I want to say 28th. I'll double check real quick. I want to say 28th, but Beamer mentioned that one of the reasons why he thinks Kai hasn't been as consistent this year in comparison to say, you know, last year or years past, they've put more on his plate. They've put more on his plate with different styles of punt. Uh, you've had rugby style punts. You've had more punts that they're looking for him to have more hang time. And the reason why they're doing all this stuff is because they're trying to limit the big returns. And you really haven't seen too many big returns on punt. I know Tennessee had a big one. They had a penalty on that. Um, but I'm trying to think. I mean, they, they've done a nice job this year, I feel like, overall. And here it is. Yep, 28th. So USC is 28th in the country in net punting. But Beamer said they can certainly be better. Like They're not saying they're satisfied with where they're at right now with that. But um, that was one thing that he mentioned on Sunday during his weekly teleconference call. Richard, Richard says we need more of Xavier Leggett and Nick Harbour. I think we'll continue to see more of Nick. And we, we talked about this after the game on Saturday. The way that he responded after having that drop was it was it was extremely positive to see. And not just speaking in terms of okay, yeah, it was great. He had six catches on Saturday. I'm talking big picture because as a freshman, from a confidence standpoint it can be really easy for things to go south right after something like that because you get down on yourself. It doesn't matter that he's a five-star. It doesn't matter that he's uh, an incredible track star as well and has took place, uh, took part in different events all over the world. In a moment like that, none of that matters. And you could easily become a shell of yourself, but that wasn't the case. And I give credit to... Spencer Rattler and the guys around him that quickly went over to Nick and showed him, hey, we support you. You're going to bounce back. You're going to be all right. So, yeah, I, th I think we're going to continue to see more of Nick Harbour, and he continues to make the most out of his opportunities as well as uh, making the most out of the hours in the day that he has. And Shane Beamer mentioned, I mean, he comes out to practice – early he's staying after practice late he's working with Xavier Leggett he's getting extra work in he's putting extra work in he's going into the building around eight o'clock on Tuesday nights to watch film with the coaches to be able to learn more to become a student of the game and we obviously know that he's a very very intelligent individual he comes from a very smart family but when you combine being freakishly athletic with the ability to be a student of the game, it can take your game to a whole different level. As far as Xavier Leggett goes, hopefully he's going to be healthier this week, right? Gets banged up. What could you really expect from him last week? Um, I think I think being able to have him have some extra days to recuperate and Hope we get back on track to being the Xavier, Xavier Leggett that we all know him to be because they certainly need him this weekend. And with the way that Harbor played the other day, it's just another wrinkle that defenses are going to have to worry about that USC could throw at you because now Harbor is starting to gain more confidence. And if Leggett's on the other side of that, look out. Look out. Justin Thomas says, is Kai trying to do too much or are we talking about a yips issue? Again, going back to – and. This question was submitted before I started talking about a, a little bit of what Shane said on Sunday. I think it's a combination of, you know, Kai probably getting in his head a little too much. Um, but I also think, too, USC has put a lot on his plate. And at some point, you have to make some adjustments. I mean, we talk about it from a de defensive standpoint that if players aren't executing at the level that you need them to consistently, at some point you have to make some type of adjustment adjustment offensively. We've seen that with USC, right? Where the offensive line, things weren't going well early in the year, they made adjustments and they were able to respond. And then unfortunately more injuries continue to pile up and they were having to deal with that as well. But I think at some point with Kai, 
you just have to let them go out there and just play. You just have to let him go out there and play because we know how talented he is. He's proven that in the past, but you want that consistency to be there. Erlin says, what's good, guys? The battle of the Gamecocks. Going to be a good one for sure. We got to dominate on both sides of the ball and let uh, and set the tone early. Yeah, first time. Gamecock versus Gamecock game. It's the battle of the Gamecocks. Um, I do think, too, as you mentioned, being good on both sides of the ball, I mentioned special teams, so all three phases. I, I think more than anything, as I threw out that stat earlier, that USC is – scored 41.7 points at home in those three games that they've played. They're only three games at williams Bryce so far this year that we're looking for the defense to take that next step. Again, they did some good things against A&M last week. Certainly it wasn't enough, but if they're able to generate the type of success they did early, especially with the 3-3-5, which I don't think they're going to play that base defense the entire game, but I think we're going to see that, and it's an added wrinkle now that's on tape and teams have to prepare for it, that if they're able to just gain more confidence this weekend, whether they're running the 3-3-5, whether they're running their, their base 4-3 look, if they do that and they're having success with it so that when you do go into this final three-game stretch after this weekend and you have to take on Vandy, Kentucky, and then, of course, Clemson, that you're feeling better about what you're doing from a defensive standpoint. Because, again – they haven't been able to force a turnover in over a month, just little things. And it's just, it can become contagious when you are able to see the results and you're able to say, okay, Hey, this is what we're doing from a player standpoint. And you're able to buy in even more. And I'm not saying the players aren't bought in, but when you have the type of results that you're looking for, especially when you've had the type of year that South Carolina has had this year, two and six defense has struggled to be consistent having those results can certainly be able to give you that added spark and boost that you're looking for. Jay Diz says, can't wait to hear from Marcus, such a smart and unique dude. Me too. Me too. We're just waiting on Marcus. Uh, I'm just shot him a message. I spoke with him around 1130 Eastern. And again, I say Eastern because he's on the West Coast. But he'll be hopping on with us momentarily. So apologize for the delay, folks. Just waiting for Marcus. Still Curtin says, I agree, Erlen. Erlen was talking about setting the tone early and being able to be dominant both sides of the ball. Chris Rivera says, what's up with Kawan Banks? Looks very sharp. Sharp. There was a Boston accent in there. Sharp in the opener versus North Carolina. I haven't seen much of him since. The only thing that I can speak of that is just trying to continue to be consistent in practice. He's done some good things um, in the limited time. I feel like we've seen him, but um, I think too, and I want to make sure that I have this correct before I speak further about banks. From a, Pull up his stats real quick. So, I mean, mainly he's been playing on special teams this year. Um, I think, I think again, from what I've been told, it's just the consistency. Erlen says, I still don't get why Banks isn't playing more in defense. Makes no sense, to be honest. They better start playing him more. To me, to me, with the number of snaps that we've seen from some of the defensive backs, I mean, my goodness, why not throw him in there? Unless he's not having the consistency in practice um, that they feel confident enough to throw him out there. And that's me just making an assumption right there. That's me making an assumption based off of some of the things that I've been told. But, um, but yeah. I mean, I think being able to have fresher legs, especially at this point of the year, certainly be welcome. Jay Diz says this team needs a complete game. Every time the O-line gets something going, they get hit with another injury. Team can't seem to catch a break this year. They can't, Jay Diz. Can't catch a break. Justin Thomas says, do they ever say what 
ex's injury was. Will it linger? I don't believe they said the specific. Uh, let me go back. Let me go back. And the reason I say that is because with all these injuries piling up, some of these injuries, you have to remind yourself as to what you're dealing with. Um, I mean, shoot, I'm not trying to be a wise guy when I say that, but I mean, at this point, you have to remind yourself, okay, what injury does he have? <laughs> or has that been talked about? Um, I think with Xavier, he was dealing with a upper body injury. I think... I believe Alyssa Lang during the game was mentioning it. Yeah, upper body injury is all we were really told as far as what the specifics, and really there's not a lot of specific there. Um, Zachary says, not trying to look too far ahead, but with all the injuries this year, one positive is the amount of invaluable experience for our freshman class. It's going to pay dividends for us in years to come. Yeah, I mean, you look at the offensive line specifically, and I know it's not just limited to offensive line, but the number of injuries that continue to pile up, pile up, pile up, it's allowed USC to really take advantage of having some of those younger guys in there. And – when you look at the guys who haven't played this year, right? A guy like Marquis uh, Anderson and even a guy like Casey Henry who was going to be playing and then he got hurt early on in the year. And then don't forget about Jalen Nichols too, who tore his ACL back in the spring. We don't know what this offensive line room will look like as far as the starting group goes. And as we all know, when it comes to the offensive line, it's not just about, okay, having five good offensive linemen, it's about which five can play the best together, which five can develop that rapport that can allow you to be able to do things that you're trying to accomplish as an offense. But at least on paper, just looking at it at face value, it should excite you. It should excite you. Um, I know people get sick and tired of hearing, uh, you know, wait until next year, wait until next year. I get that, but... I mean, we're just calling it for what it is. A lot of injuries on the offensive line. Not ideal. Certainly no one signs up for that. And why would you, right? Like, hey, let's just have this, and then we'll be better for next year. No, you want to be able to be at your best right away. But certainly that hasn't been the case for South Carolina because these injuries continue to pile up. Jay Diz says, Javon Williams was cracking skulls. I want to see more of that on third down. Justin Thomas said, that's what I was thinking, Zachary. Talking about the positivity with the younger guys getting in there. Desmond Ben says, I'm going to be giving out five grants to the first seven people to hit me up. Faith, because I feel some people going through hard times. Y'all stay blessed. How about that, Desmond? Travis Edwards says, what's up, GC Live fam? What's up, Travis? And again, folks, if you're just joining us, you're wondering if you missed it. Marcus has not hopped on quite yet. I told Marcus to he could hop on whenever he was ready between the two and three window. Uh, I just shot him a message a little while ago. So just wait on Marcus to hop on in. But again, Marcus Lattimore will be in town next week. He'll be doing a signing in the Columbia area. So if you want to be able to talk with the Gamecock, great. Get your picture taken with them. Get an autograph. You'll have an opportunity to do so next week. And you also have an opportunity, as soon as he hops on, to ask him questions. And I'm sure a lot of people have questions and thoughts about that incredible run between 2010 and 2013 that Marcus was part of as those teams will be honored this weekend at williams Bryce Stadium. Matt says, where has Eddie Lewis gone? He showed some good moments, then vanished. I've been very surprised that we haven't seen more of Eddie Lewis from an offensive standpoint. And 
I don't want to make any assumptions as far as, you know, why that hasn't been why he hasn't been playing from an offensive standpoint more. But other than special teams, we really haven't seen him play that much on wide at wide receiver. Or I shouldn't say at playing as much, but just not getting involved as much. It didn't Kroger hurt his foot last year. Hopefully it's not a recurring issue. I don't think it has anything to do with his foot. I don't think it has anything to do with his foot. I just think, unfortunately, he's just, he's kind of, he's kind of been in his head a little bit, but also some of it has to do with the fact that USC, as Beamer mentioned on Sunday, they've put a lot on his plate this year with just different styles of punts, rugby style, um, some punts more so focusing on hang time, just trying to do whatever they can to prevent some of these talented returners from being able to get loose and get going. And I think at some point, though, you have to just simplify things and just let your players just play. And I think some of that, some of it, I think, you know, if we had like a pie graph, I don't think it's all just one thing and I think it's multiple things, but I think that plays a part of it as well, based on what Beamer mentioned the other night. Um, Eric says, I know it's way too early, but do you think next year will be better? It will be a better year. Well, I think when you look at the schedule, it doesn't get easier, right? You got to play Bama, got to play Oklahoma, got to play Ole Miss. Um, I'll pull up the schedule w- real quick so that people can see that. And I know some people don't like talking about next year quite yet. And I get that, but try to answer the question best we can. When you look at the schedule for next year, LSU's in there as well. So the only one that you won't see, there we go. Pull this up for you guys. Again, waiting for Marcus to hop on, and then we will talk with Marcus. And if Marcus is running a little behind, we get into that 3 o'clock hour, we will uh, keep things rolling. So I don't want you guys to think, God forbid, and I'm not saying that's going to be the case here, but God forbid we will keep things rolling so you guys have an opportunity to ask Marcus whatever questions you guys have. But uh, that's a look at next year's schedule. Obviously, for the conference games, those have not been announced as far as when those games will be played. You see Vandy down here. I know Vandy won't appear on the schedule, and I scroll trying to make everything fit on screen. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a tough schedule next year. And look at the road games, though. It's not just who you're playing. It's where you're playing them at. At Clemson, at Bama. At Kentucky, at Oklahoma. So I've said this before. I still think South Carolina is two years away from really being able to do some damage. But we'll wait and see as far as that go. All right. I told you he'd be coming. They didn't think they weren't believing me. They weren't believing me, Marcus. They thought I was Mike. Mike, I had I had a time relapse, man. I was think I was thinking I was thinking two hours, three hours. You know the the time, the time, the location of the West Coast, East Coast. It got me. It got me this morning, man. I that's my bad, man. West Coast time screws me up. I had to go out to Missouri, the other Columbia, a couple weeks ago, and Central time throws me off sometimes. And uh, oh man, man, I got you, man. But no, nonetheless, Marcus Lattimore is here. First off, man, just how you been? Because we, you know, we used to talk a good bit with the show, but I haven't had a, t- a chance to talk to you in a minute. Just how have you been? How have I been? Uh, it's good to see you, Mike. It's good to see your face. Um, life has been uh, filled with a lot of new things. Um, I've been diving a lot more into poetry. Uh, poetry has been my practice. Um, I've been doing a lot of spoken word here in Portland, Oregon, where I live. And uh, I'm overcoming a lot of fears in this new endeavor. And it's been fun. It really has. Um, It's been fun. It's been scary. 
and life but life has been good mike i mean i really i can't complain i mean it's it's uh it's been sunny um uh, <laughs> over the past couple of days and i embrace the sun uh but the rain is coming up in the northwest uh so uh just getting ready for that but man i mean life is good i i i, I can't complain you know <laughs> Now we've talked about it and, you know, maybe, maybe another time we'll go down the, 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 the trip down memory lane. But I remember when we were doing the show together, I mean, you talked about it, man. We talked about it off camera before. I mean, it could have been real easy for you to stay in South Carolina. You were happy with the job, but you felt like you could help out more people in a, in a wider range. And, um, you know, it's not easy to be able to look at something and say, Hey, I'm just going to get out of my comfort zone and go tackle something new. You know, because it could have been real easy for you to stay here, and I'm sure you would have been happy. But at the same time, too, there was other opportunities out there for you to be able to help more people out. And I give you a lot of credit for that, man. And as you said, you're still trying to figure out who you are. And I give a lot of credit to you, man, because that's not easy when you could just become real comfortable in a place where, shoot, you go to any bar and was going to buy you a drink, just tell you how great you are. But, you know, you, you, you decided to go out of your comfort zone. I, I respect the hell out of you for that. I mean, life is short, you know, life is short. Carolina is always home. Uh, but I mean, at the end of the day, I, I, I'd rather challenge myself, challenge uh, myself to, to learn something new and, and, and grow in a new place. Um, but you, I mean, y'all know Carolina, Carolina is in my blood. I want to get into what you're going to be doing next weekend here in Columbia. And a lot of Gamecock fans are going to be excited to hear that. But I will answer just – I'll ask one question real quick before we get into that. Jay Diz says, what's it like out there? What's life like in the Pacific life, Northwest? What's life like in the Pacific Northwest? Um, I mean, that I don't even know how to answer that. Um, it's sure, beautiful. It's, Different, right? Different than Columbia, for sure. It's, it's beautiful. Um, it is a lot of art. I, I feel like art here is a art is a segue. Like, okay, so I, I guess this is the best way I can describe. It. When I meet people here, they lead with their hobbies. They don't lead with what they do. They don't lead with their job. Uh, they lead, they say, uh, I like to fish or um, I like to paint or I like to do poetry. They, it, It's a place, it's a city full of introverted, creative people. Uh, they say keep Portland weird and, and it is a weird place. Um, and that's what I think that's what I like about it because I'm a weird dude. Um, and I like to try new things and different things and being different and, and just um, learn, learn new things. Um, it, it's a, but the Northwest in general, I mean, it's views everywhere you look, you know, it's, it's like, a, it's like majestic land. Uh, Mount Hood, Mount Hood. I see every day I, I, I drive out my driveway to my right, Mount St. Helen to my left. Mount Rainier in the distance. You got the desert to the south. You got the beach to the to the west. And I mean, it's just just these crazy, crazy, crazy dramatic views. Mm. And um, I don't know. You get a lot of time in silence. That's what I think. That's what I like. But I need some silence in my life. Yeah. Shoot. We could all use that. We yeah. could all use that, but I know that you still appreciate the love and support you get from Gamecock fans. We're continuing to see. We keep popping up the messages and comments. Gamecock420 says, Marcus, we love you. Go Gamecocks. And next weekend, they're going to have an opportunity to be able to show you that love that they continue to show you from afar right now because you're obviously out there in Oregon. But you're going to be in Columbia next week, Marcus. Isn't that right? I will be there on Thursday at six o'clock at Founders, uh, and that and that's in that's the the Founders and Forest Drive. Um, I got the full details for you if you want me to read it off. I was I didn't want to steal your thunder. 
Yeah, I'll be is. there. I'll, Gamecocks, I'll be there signing autographs for an hour and for about two hours, actually. And mm. that's it. And that's the Founders and Forest Drive. Is it so the, come, uh, so come the Navy see. Federal Credit Union? Navy Federal Credit Union. Yep, at East Forest Plaza. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put that. I'm going to put that up in the comment section. So if anyone wants to write that down, that's where Marcus will be Thursday, November 9th at the Navy Federal Credit Union, East Forest Plaza, 5424 Forest Drive, Columbia, South Carolina at 615. 615. Come see me. Come give me a hug. Let's catch up. It'll be a good time. Well, it's going to be a good time, and people are looking forward to being able to see you out there. And I'm going to pull, Trey, I'll pull your question back up there in a minute because, Marcus, I know unfortunately you won't be able to make it this weekend, but South Carolina is going to be honoring the 2010 through 2013 teams. And, I mean, shoot, outside of that Black Magic year, those were the greatest years of Gamecock football. And as you can see that's, from people, that's what they say, Mike. Yeah, from people commenting on here, um, a lot of the memories that you were a part of are part of their greatest sports memories. What do you remember from that time period? And I asked Perry Orth this the other day. I know he played on the 2013 team, but you were obviously in the thick of things in 2010, 11, and 12. What made those teams so special? <laughs> um wow our mentality our mentality we had great leaders mike we had we had guys who set the precedent and i mean the first when you say that when when i think about that era one one really one person comes to mind because he kind of set the tone of our identity and that's dj swearinger um, he came in in 2009, and anybody who has seen DJ Swearinger play or watched him speak, uh, he 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 breathes from his soul. Uh, that dude is a leader leader of leaders, uh, and not only did he talk it, he backed it up. Uh, so our mentality was violent i mean if you look if you really look during that time we were bullies like we were like our defense would bully the sec and then our offense was dominant as well like we we were the dominant team um i mean just as far as our mindset we, we were just calculated killers and that was set in by dj that was set by rodney park um steven garcia like they all they all had these they all had these mentalities that we had to follow if you didn't follow that mentality you weren't the game cop so so we were tough we were physical we were violent and i mean that's really the and really we would we we it would be in the fourth quarter and we would know the game would be over just but by, by the look in the opponent's eyes I mean, we had that type of team. You mentioned Garcia. You mentioned just the physicality and just the dogness that you guys had. And I'm just speaking on what he's told me, but I want to hear it in your words. We often hear from coaches saying, you know, I want to make sure that practices are tougher than games. Now, obviously, from a talent standpoint, you guys certainly had the talent to be able to do that every day. But on top of that, as Garcia's told me, like it didn't matter that Connor Shaw was in the quarterback room with him. It didn't matter who he was going up against in practice. Like you were the enemy. Like it didn't matter who you were. <laughs> and you guys just had that mentality so that come game day, it made things a hell of a lot easier. Is that fair to say? And you know, there was some, that that's beautiful. It is beautifully said. And you know that it, there's so many guys on that team that adopted that mindset. Like I think about the AJ can. Like if you if anybody has ever met AJ Can, who's like on his ninth year in the NFL, uh, who was our left guard and right guard yep. during that time, he had a long uh, career in the NFL too. By the way, 
long career. Which gets yeah. overlooked in some of the old linemen, which I know yeah. you got a lot of love for. Uh they get they don't they don't get the same shine. No, but he was so gentle off the field. Like he was, he was the, he was the most gentle teddy bear you'd ever meet off the field. But, but you, when, when, when you put on that Gamecock jersey, at least during 2009 to 2012, I mean, it was 2013. It was, I mean, you, 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 you were a killer. I see someone bring this up. Jay Diz says, "What was practice like versus DJ Super Melon?" Cloudy, <laughs> and that's during the good on good period. And I can only imagine, you know, a lot of those good on good periods you're trying to hold back, especially in the season. But I'm sure because you guys are just competitive, you guys are just competitive. I'm sure sometimes, that's a good question, you know, those thuds were a little bit harder. Oh my goodness, my my first my first training camp coming in as a freshman, obviously DJs playing uh playing safety. I catch the screen and. I go about 15 yards, and, I mean, he just – he lays me out. Like, I'm talking about – and it was it was really a uh, – you know, really just all those guys you mentioned, DJ, Super Male, Clowney wasn't there yet. But, I mean, that, that defense was just so big and nasty and just their mentality, man. They stood over me and was like, welcome to the SEC. So, I mean, I, I, I knew what I was getting into. Uh, after my first training camp, um, I mean, just the sheer athleticism of all those dudes. Like they would, DJ could have played basketball. Melvin could have played baseball. Clowney, Clowney could be a, a, a Usain Bolt. If I he heard played. those intramural basketball teams are pretty dang good. I mean, that's what we, I've heard. Man, they, those dudes were just were athletes. Ridiculous. Just at just athletes that could do anything they wanted to do. I mean, Melvin could play quarterback. You know, so I mean, we just had so many guys that defied just de defied all laws of humanity when it comes to how you move your body. You know, I mean, Devin Devin Taylor. I mean, I mean, it's it's just so many guys. If you just keep going down the list, that we 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 were. We were athletically gifted, but also we had leaders that worked the hardest. Our leaders worked the hardest. There's plenty of questions coming in. I'm going to do my best to get them all to you. Uh, but as we all know, Marcus is very insightful. He's not going to give you a BS answer. So he might go down a little rabbit hole and down memory lane. So, uh, you know, feel free to not be as keep it. Keep it as long or short as ever you want, Marcus. And I'll try to get these over to you. But I'm going to kind of – where was this? Oops, Big Red. You got you sent me two of them. I thought that you had a good one, though. You know, in this – I want to use this answer. And I, and I know you're following the Gamecocks from afar, but there's so many people that are curious about your thoughts on USC. And since you know, we haven't done a Believe episode in, in a while, they want to know your thoughts on USC this year. But asking you this question first and then kind of trickling over into this year's team – were there leaders for every position, or was it more of an offense defense leadership overall mentality? Mm. I would say DJ Swearinger set the tone. He set the tone of the overall team of what was expected when you stepped out on the field. Um, but I mean, I. I Heck, I mean, we also had the confidence of Coach Spurrier, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, so, I mean, you, you walk out on the field with that type of confidence and, and that type of knowing um, that, that that you can win every game, <laughs> I mean, that, that kind of gives you a boost too. But I, I would say DJ set the tone of that culture uh, just because of how intense he was. Mm. Um, and, and that that intensity kind of just spread to offense. It spread to defense. Um, Travian Robertson um, was was also another guy that everybody when he spoke, everybody was all ears. Um, so I mean, de defense really created our identity. I would say. 
shoot, as a player, I don't know. I mean, you've gone through adversity in your life, but I don't know how much, how many teams, I mean, shoot, during your Burns days, for crying out loud, you guys were a powerhouse. So I say that because this team, unfortunately, this year, they're two and six. They still have an opportunity to go bowling if they went out. But obviously, it starts with just getting a win this week and first and foremost. And Frederick says, Marcus, what would you tell this year's team as motivation based on where they are right now at two and six? It's tough. I mean, it's tough. It's not the season that you wanted. Um, And everybody, I mean, heck, everybody recognizes that. But I mean, hell, I mean, what, 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 what can you do? But like, just lay it all out on the line, you know, because I I know one thing I know for sure about Coach Beamer is all the tricks about to come out the bag now. (laughs) I mean, there isn't there isn't not one thing that he's going to leave in. He's about to expose everything he's got in that special teams arsenal on offense. We about to get creative on defense. We about to do what we got to do to put pressure on the quarterback. So, I mean, Coach Beamer is going to set the tone to say leave leave everything like leave nothing leave leave nothing leave no doubt because that's i know that's what he's about to do i know you have tremendous tremendous respect for the carry on joiner and i think this entire fan base feels that exact same way and he talked about the message he sent to the team on tuesday before practice which was hey look we only have four more guaranteed opportunities you know let's enjoy this every single day i say that because unfortunately he went through some tough years early on in his career. I know that you were so part of that staff. What do you think he learned from those tough years? And again, obviously he's dealt with adversity outside of football and he's just an incredibly strong individual, but what do you think he learned during that time period, which will help be the leader that this team needs him to be during this time period? He's, he's been a constant, He's he's been one of the, one of the constants in that operations facility over the past five years, um, and me really just to see him still, still with that same. His mindset hasn't changed since I met him at eighteen years old. I mean, it, it's still like, what can I, giving my all? What can I do? It's still that selfless person. I mean, he's still that selfless dude. And I don't know, man. I, I, he's just a pillar for the state of South Carolina, just in general. I mean, he's kind of like an example you can use to teach off of. I mean, if you're a teacher in South Carolina, of like how to handle adversity. I mean, he's the perfect example. So, I mean, it, it's... <sighs> More than anything, I think he's he's shown that change change is con- change is constant, but mm-hmm. you, you don't have to you you don't have to act, you don't have to like change who you are, you know. Mm-hmm. So I mean that that's what he, that's what I've learned from his life, Mike. Uh, change is always going to be a constant thing, but that 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 doesn't mean you have to uh re- retreat or or lose your values as a person that dude is i don't know man <laughs> that dude's special marcus I, I have to ask you about running back and obviously look to carry on joiner i'm sure he'd be the first person that would say hey you know i wish things went a little bit differently but as we talked about he's a team first guy he's never gonna pout he's only gonna help the guys out around him mario anderson he comes in from division two school and as you told me and correct me if I'm wrong, you've told me in the past one of the easiest ways to get on the field and stay on the field is if you can gain the confidence from your coaching staff in pass pro. And I think that's one of the reasons why to carry on Joiner, as I tried to explain to people earlier in the year, that was probably one of the main reasons why he stayed out there as long as he did. But he's been able to grow the vision, understanding the just – the the increase in what's being asked from you at this level and compared to Div- Division Two, what has your take been about what this young man's been doing, especially as a former running back at this university? <laughs> oh man, 
Mike, yeah, I, I was waiting. I was waiting on you to ask me that. And Wes Mitchell and Wes Mitchell's <laughs> watching. Shout out to our colleague what, Wes. Mitchell. What's up, Wes? Um, wow. I mean, that dude is possessed. I mean, <laughs> he is. He is. I. He is possessed out there, and it does. It it doesn't see see that type of back. I don't you don't really see those type of backs anymore. Uh he he's like an anomaly from just watching the whole surveying all of college football. Um he is he just runs with I mean everybody can see his heart when he's running. You it's not even that he he's running with his heart. I mean every single play it's just being poured out onto the field. And, and it's every single run. It's it's not. It, he doesn't take a play off. You don't see guys <laughs> that don't. I, I hadn't seen this not one time. You know, ta- and, you, and you see that. So take me off the field. Just to take let people me, know what you're talking about. Yep. I'm tired. I'm tired, coach. Nope. He keeps take running. Me off the field. That's that's not in his DNA. Um, I I I've never met him, but I look forward to the opportunity to meet him. Um, young man. By the way, Mark is just he just announced yesterday that him and his girlfriend are going to be welcoming a, a child in wow. the near future. So congratulations to wow. Mario Anderson, because that was kept under wraps. Not saying that would be all over the place, but I mean, stuff sometimes leaks out. But he announced that yesterday. So, I mean, another reason to be running hard. And I keep saying this to people, I keep reminding people, but I just want to continue to say this because. It doesn't matter how many times I've said this. He still has an extra year of eligibility, so he can still come back next year. He redshirted in 19. 2020 was the COVID season. Uh, 2020, 2019, excuse me, at Newberry. And then, of course, he came over here last year. So he's only played three years, not counting that COVID year. So he can come back next year. But a lot of people have talked about how they he reminds them of Mike Davis. Yeah. And <laughs> – and the Same reason I say type, that, yeah. Mark, is because people talk about the body type. What is it, though, certain things that maybe to people on the outside that the naked eye can't see, but as a teammate of his and someone that played the position, what are some of those things that Mike Davis did so damn well that you're also seeing in Mario? Well, you, you, you don't expect with that body type. You, you know, The last thing you expect with that body type is for them to have quick feet. Or, or, or just be crafty within the hole. And they, and they have this ability, both of them have this ability to make this jump cut, like this quick jump cut, but also get back vertical real fast at the same time. Like it, it, it's, it, it, they're compact, you know, they have so much power within their, from their thighs to their core. Like right here is where they're living. They're living within yep. those thigh muscles in that core. And they're able to make these jump cuts, these quick jump cuts, but get back forward at the same time. And and, and just like in a blink, they gain like eight yards. And you and, and it's just like, but but I think it's also at the same time, it's just that they're fat, like literally just flat out speed. They have flat, he, Mario Anderson and Mike Davis, they have flat out speed. They can run. They can run away from people, but also they're stocky, you know, which is, I mean, it's just so rare to see that. Anything else stand out to you about this offense? I mean, obviously they have been plagued, plagued by the injury bug on the offensive line. It feels Mm -hmm. like it's been musical chairs, but I feel like Dal Loggins has done a a real nice job of being able to roll with the punches. Um, Certainly it starts with Spencer Rattler, as he calls him. Spaghetti sauce because he can cover up everything. But what have you liked about this offense? And again, we're not saying that everything's sunshine to rainbows, but we've only had a chance to talk to you once this season. Is there certain things that stand out to you? Is there certain things maybe you'd like them to try maybe differently over these next couple of games? Yeah. Um it's 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 been it's been challenging to watch sometimes, honestly, you know, just, just, I mean, most of it is outside of their control, you know, given the offensive line situation. Um, you really can't do anything, think about that, you know? Um, I mean, look at Colorado. I mean, they got, they got Shadur, 
They got, I mean, Spencer, Shadur, they're both up there. They have, they have these, they have these skills, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what kind of skills you got. Um, you know, if, if you're losing offensive linemen left to right. So, I mean, so we've been, we've been hit by that, but I mean, it, heck it's, it's really, it's really been fun seeing Trey Knox grow, um, into what he's become. He doesn't, I mean, he doesn't drop too many balls, you know? So that's, that's been, that's been good to see. And then obviously everybody raves about Nick Harper, you know, and I think he's, I think he's special. I think he's going to be really special. Can we talk about um, Harbor? Can we talk about yeah. Harbor so I don't forget that. No doubt. Because doubt. when we talked about it on the Believe podcast, and you talked about it because you understand what that what that pressure feels like. You come in there, you're the five star, right? Everyone expects you to be the guy from day one. And I think with Harbor, what some people feel to just remember is that he wasn't a five-star wide receiver coming out of high school. He was a five-star DN slash tight end. He was an athlete, <laughs> and it was going to take some time to him to adjust to wide receiver. And he's been a guy that's been learning a lot from Xavier Leggett. Beamer's been talking about that. He goes out there early. He stays after practice, right? But as someone that had to go through what this young man is dealing with, and maybe, and no disrespect to Nick, but maybe you had to deal with it just a little bit more because you were an in-state kid, so the expectations are probably even higher. What is that like as a freshman when you know the entire Gamecock community is looking at you, hoping that you can be the guy that can rise to the occasion to be able to take this program to the next level? It's uh, it's daunting. It really is. You know, given, I mean, heck, and I, given everybody that's in his ear as well, you know, there's, I mean, there's just so many different, voices in your head nil error too back at home and then you got the nil you have so you just got so many external forces that you have to deal with that has nothing to do with football but it seems to me that he stayed focused on the main thing and that's just becoming a better receiver and i mean honestly i'm surprised that he's picked up the 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 nuances of the position as fast as he has, because playing receiver in the SEC at the highest level, when you've never done it, I mean, it doesn't really doesn't matter how good of you, good of, how great of an athlete you are. I mean, except if you, I mean, Travis Hunter, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, it, it it doesn't it doesn't matter. I mean, it, it takes time, I mean, you know, like and just as you mentioned, I mean, he came from defensive end. Defensive end and tight end. I mean, and now he's trying to learn the nuances of uh, of a position going up against the Georgia Georgia Bulldogs. Like, I mean, I'm I'm impressed by by at least what I see from what I see from him on TV. You know, what I mean, it's just like he's a team guy. It looks like he's a team guy. It looks like he. I mean, his run after catch, like he doesn't want to go down. Mm -hmm. Um. I've been impressed by that, but all of those external factors, I mean, it kind of seems like it's not really bothering him. Um, and he's done a good job of staying focused on, well, what can I do today to become a better receiver? That's what I've seen. You have, you have a couple minutes for some extra, a uh, couple extra questions, yeah, Marcus. For sure. Awesome. And just real quick, guys, if you're just joining us, Marcus is going to be back in Columbia next weekend, Thursday, November 9th, at the Navy Federal Credit Union at East Forest Plaza. That is 5424 Forest Drive, Columbia, at 615. Signing autographs, taking pictures. He said, give him a big old hug because he Come hasn't see seen me. some of you guys in quite some time. So that is where Marcus will be next week. Um, before I ask you another question, though, I do want to bring this up, Marcus, because it's fairly new. And I know you're a humble man. But it leads into some of the questions, and everyone, you guys have had some outstanding questions for Marcus, and I'm going to do my best to get to all of them. But it was announced recently, a couple weeks ago, that you've been selected for the 2023 SEC Football Legends class, which will be honored during the SEC Football Weekend of Champions December 1st and 2nd in Atlanta, Georgia, highlighted by the annual SEC Legends Celebration on December 1st at the College Football Hall of Fame in Atlanta. Again, I know you're a humble man, um, 
unfortunately, you had to deal with a lot of adversity during your football career. You had to deal with adversity off the field as well. You know what this community thinks about you. And that's not trying to say that it's not enough, but to be honored by the SEC <laughs> Legends Weekend. I mean, what does this mean for you, to you? Mm. Uh, it's, mm. I, th- thank you for uh, mentioning that, Mike. Um, you know, I got you, buddy. Uh, I, you know, I, it's hard for me sometimes to recognize my football career uh, because I, as you mentioned, I did go through a lot of adversity, uh, but I wear this, I wear this honor proudly. I, I wear this, I wear this induction into uh, this exclusive, exclusive club proudly. I do. And, and I, and I embrace it and it's amazing. It really is. I mean, I see who's going to be there. I mean, Patrick <laughs> Patrick Willis is going to be there, and I'm going to be standing right next to Patrick Willis. You know, I mean, it, it's um, um, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. It's beautiful for me. It's beautiful for my family, and I'm gonna I'm gonna embrace every second of it. I say that because I think it leads into another good question that I saw. And I know it seems like it's one of those questions that's a rhetorical one, but it was asked by one of our subscribers on Gamecock Central, BM underscore 12. And it says, does he embrace the impact that he's had at South Carolina on the program and this fan base? And again, probably a rhetorical question, but at the same time too, like we said, you know, Football is a game. Football has given both of both of us, um, and you know, we've got to know each other real well over the last near, nearly decade. It's given us both a lot. I mean, fortunate I get to cover it, um, and obviously, it's brought you to tremendous places, Marcus. But do you ever just think about the impact you've made at South Carolina and the impact you've had on so many people's lives because of not just what you've done on the field, but the impact you've made around the community and just the way that you carry yourself i'm starting to realize that (laughs) um i in in the past you know when you're 16 years old growing up in a small town in south carolina you you don't you don't know what's coming um i didn't know what was coming i was just living my life um and, and playing football and having fun and you know and then you get to this stage you know, you get to this stage where millions of Carolinians um, enjoy what you do and and appreciate who you are. Um, I'm starting to realize that. I, I mean, it, it, I I think Mike, if I if I was never removed from it, if I was never removed from South Carolina, from being immersed in it. I, I don't think I would be able to see it clearly. I, now I can see it from a different view, and it's like, okay, I, I've um, my voice matters. My voice matters to the state of South Carolina. Um, my what what I've what I've done matters to the mm. people there, and um, and and you know I I do I. I try to do my best to use that in a constructive way and mm. in a constructive way, but also in a way that is fair and just, you know? So, I mean, I've learned a lot about myself. I've learned a lot about, you know, what do we need? What, what, what do we, what does South Carolina need to hear from me, you know, and how can I best leave my legacy? And, you know, and it, and it's not really making people happy. It's about doing what's right mm. and saying what's right. Um, so that's how I plan on, you know, like using my voice for, you know, until until there is no more. But Mike, I'm starting to realize it. Yes, and I don't want, and I don't want to turn this into the like Doctor Phil and get you all emotional asking you all these, uh, you know, lovey dovey 
questions. Um, so I appreciate you, brother. Kevin Lucas no, says 21 good. should be the next number on the press box at Williams Bryce. Uh, Wes, and unfortunately, hey, look, I love all the people that are submitting questions, but when you are a colleague like Wes, uh, he gets the fast pass at Disney World. He gets to cut the line. And he gets <laughs> to ask the question. So, um, and I don't remember. I mean, we talked about a lot about your recruiting process. If I remember during the Believe episodes that we did together, Marcus, but I can't remember if we talked specifically about what Wes wants to ask. And Wes says, um, when did, you, when during the recruiting process, did you know you were going to go to South Carolina? He's like, I'm sure he's given an answer back then, but it may be more open with all the time that has passed. I distinctly remember him talk, uh, taking his South Carolina official visit and then publicly saying Auburn was the leader. Always wondered if Auburn really led then or not. And if so, what changed? <laughs> You know, Wes, he doesn't forget anything. I mean, that's why him and Chris are some of the best when it comes to following recruiting for South Carolina. All these years later, he probably has that down to the T of how it all played out. Wes, um, Wes, I was I was playing the game at 18. <laughs> now, 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 I was just coming into this, like, attention. You know, all this attention and notoriety and publicity. I don't think that I wanted it to end. You know, so I had to, I had to like play. I, I don't know if Auburn was first. I don't know if Penn State was first. Penn State was up there for a good minute. I don't know if it was Auburn, South Carolina, or Penn State. All I know is that I was enjoying all of that attention at 18 years old. You know, so maybe it was. Maybe it wasn't, but I think what came down to South Carolina really was Coach Spurrier. It, I mean, it was it was the meeting that Coach Spurrier, he came to my house. It was snowing. And uh, he said, Marcus, we going to run the ball. And I believed him. I believed that we were going to run the ball. And, I mean, I was like, hell, it would be cool to play for your in-state school. Um, Auburn, I tell you, Auburn was the best official visit, you know, I mean, it, I mean, we, we had a great time and I envisioned myself with Michael Dyer, you know, us running that wildcat, you know, like Darren McFadden and Felix mm -hmm. Jones did back at Arkansas back in the day. That vision in my mind was beautiful, but Coach Furrier sold me. You mentioned the attention and I know you've had the, the privilege of coaching high school football you've had the privilege of being around college kids right now but especially the high school kids during your time at Heathwood with NIL the way that it's growing and I'm sure okay I mean we're not stupid and I'm sure you we've talked about this before when we went on the shows that we did together it would have been nice if it was around during your time yeah, period yeah, yeah, let me get <laughs> you know that. Haven't, said, haven't said that Marcus haven't said all that Based on what you just said right there, you don't want it to end and it can become a drug. You can be addicted to it um, Yes. with NIL as much good. And again, these players are earning it. You know, if you would have got paid during that time period, the way that some of these guys are getting paid, like you would have earned it. Um, but Jay Diz says, you know, what's Marcus thoughts on NIL for the young men? Does it make navigating the college sports life even harder now? I couldn't I couldn't imagine. I, I could I could not imagine adding that exponent to everything else that I had in my life during that time. I mean, I was I was gaining more followers on Twitter, gaining more followers on Instagram, gaining more followers from girls. I mean, it was um, you had Tennessee. Every, you had ten, you had, you had Tennessee uh, fans showing up to your games uh, saying we want Marcus. <laughs> hey, what are you doing after the game? <laughs> I mean, I mean, it's allegedly, allegedly, it's all, it, it, all of it is just, it's pandemonium every single day. And for a young brain, you add money, you add more, you add money to that. I could, I couldn't imagine. I mm. could not imagine what happens behind closed doors today. Um, it, it, it is, it is a monster, but. If you have good people around you, you can control that monster. 
I think I I think I would have um I think we have good people. You know, I think Demo is involved a lot in these processes. Coach Beamer obviously is preparing yeah, I, our guys in so many and different ways. And I could ways. throw up I could throw up big, big what Big Red said and you don't have to answer that specifically, but basically continuing to go off of what you're saying. Just wanted to throw that up there because you're talking a lot about that if, you know, Coach Demo and all them over there. Yes. You, know, like you said you have a good. You, you're, you're saying that South Carolina has a good staff in place right now with handling that. That's why I threw that question up. Because you're you're practically you were practice practically answering it. Sorry to throw you off yeah. your. Uh, no, no, no. Run. I mean, it's so different. Those those two. I mean, Coach Spurrier is is he's an American icon. You know, like so. You, you, you're making a you're making it's just a complete a different completely different decision when you have coach beamer um coach beamer i mean heck you feel like you're being you're going to be held you're going to be embraced you're going you're going to feel safe around this person um yeah i mean i, I i'd love to play for coach beamer heck yeah um how different would it be i mean it's just, it, it's <laughs> It, it, it's it's a it's a movie star versus you know like it, it's a movie star versus an up and coming the up and coming Keanu Reeves <laughs> <laughs> you know it's like that's what it is so so Beamer is uh, Keanu Reeves Keanu Reeves <laughs> I uh, might see him tonight at Carolina calls I'll have to let him know that I know he's got <laughs> bigger things to worry about right now but. Uh, We'll wrap things up, man, because I, man, I'm very appreciative of your time. Someone says, Zachary, been missing the Believe podcast from you two. It was good stuff. Hope we can get it back one day soon. We'll get it back, Zach. We'll get it back. I know you've had a lot going on, Marcus. So we'll make it, we'll make it work, though. Um, if you're open to it, Marcus, I'm open to it. You know Let's that. Let's do it. We'll, we'll crank it back it. up. Awesome. Let's see. We'll wrap things up here. Oh, we got to ask about your mother. I haven't asked about your mother, man. Mm -hmm. Everyone loves your mother. How's she doing? She's been to a few games this year, actually. Uh, I haven't seen her. Games. Usually, I do. Yeah, she she she's out there uh, hugging on all the recruits and all the <laughs> all the uh, all the boys that she that she remembers from that time. The carry the carry on, obviously. Um, but she's doing well. She's doing well. She's living in the upstate. Uh, she works. She still works at Burns High School, my old high school. So she's still terrorizing the kids there. Um, and uh, I'll see. I'll see her next weekend. So I'll Love let that. you know. I'll, I'll give you. A, I'll give you a better update, Richard. Love that. If you if you come to if you come to Navy, uh, you'll see her there. Yep. There you go. Navy go, to the credit union. go to the signing. Go to the signing. Got here real quick, and we'll wrap this up. I thought this was a good one. Zachary says, statement in question for Marcus. I'm very happy for you and your current endeavors. I can see the joy you have when speaking about your life. Would you ever consider to move to a position coach at USC? Now, obviously, you, uh, are you, you're still at Lewis and Clark, correct? Mentoring. Mentoring now. but you I, had, I, work, I, work, I work with basketball. I yep. work with football. And I know, I know from our talks how important that is to you how important that is to you. And that's not taking anything away. And I want to make sure too, when you answer this question, because I know people are saying USC positional coach. I know you, you enjoy a lot of things outside of football. And that's not to say you don't care about football, but I just want to make sure if people hear what you, because I have a feeling what you're going to say. I just want people to understand that it's not just a USC thing. It's just in general. C correct, Mike. You know uh, I got you. I got to make yeah, sure we, yeah, yeah. we tighten the knots on the, on both ends. Z Zach, I don't I don't see my life going in that trajectory. I don't. I see I see myself teaching more than coaching. Um, do I do I do I do I see myself as a professor one day, or or a teacher one day? I mean, I mean, hell of it, yeah, I I, I do. Um, but I don't see my my life going in the trajectory of back back to high stakes college football. If anything, it'll be in mentoring and developing the and player development again. But not not in coaching. Coaching is a um, 
is an art, like an art form that takes at that level it takes all of you um it, it takes all of your energy and all of your time and i don't know my wife my wife and i we like to travel <laughs> and again just to make sure because you know how these things go you understand how how you say one thing oh marcus doesn't want to coach at usc it's not just talking about usc just want to make sure we throw that out there. Correct, Marcus? I, I can put the word, but you can just say it. Put it in your own words. It's not just USC, correct? It, it has nothing to do with football. Yep. It has, no, it has nothing to do with football. I mean, if anything, coaching football, it, it'll be Little League. You know, just, just, just because that, that, gives me, that gives me more time to do other things. You've talked about it with me before. You enjoy the purity of it. Yeah, enjoy the purity, you know, because it is a business, especially at that level of the SEC. Um, and you've obviously have coached high school, you've coached Division three football, which you know, no disrespect to D two and D three, but the further you go down, it's not as much of a business. Not saying that it's not business like. You still got to wake up early and do the two a days. I can tr tell you, my body still feels the pain from ten years ago D two football. But uh, the purity, I know you've said that how much you've enjoyed that side of it. So no question about it, man. I, 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 gained, I gained the love back mm -hmm. for the game with, because, because I went to a lower level. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, again, guys, Marcus Lattimore will be back in town next week, and it's going to be a great two weeks because, again, you got a lot of these former players going to be back in town getting honored for the 2010-2013 span. Uh, Steve Spurrier, well, he'll be back in town too uh, this weekend. But if you want to catch <laughs> that Marcus, was good, Mike. That appreciate was good. it. Appreciate. It. I, I I did a round of golf with him once at George Rogers uh, event. So heard some good stories. Heard some real good stories. Really. <laughs> but uh, Thursday, November 9th, week from today, the Navy Federal Credit Union East Forest Plaza, five four two four Forest Drive. At 6.15, and the dumb question, but I'm going to ask anyway, does that mean you're going to the game next weekend? I'll be there. He'll be there. Marcus will be there. Marcus, appreciate you. Always appreciate you, man. Uh, we'll definitely talk sooner rather than later. And um, you're always, always welcome to come on. I appreciate your time. And I know a lot of people that tuned in today apologize. They wouldn't get to everyone's questions. But appreciate everyone patient today because they were – Certainly waiting to see you today. So we appreciate you hopping on. Mike, I'm glad you're a Gamecock, man. Appreciate you. I appreciate you, man. Yeah, Marcus Lattimore, former Gamecock running back, joining us today on GC Live. You can catch him next week here in town. That was awesome. That was awesome. Really enjoyed Marcus taking the time to hop on. I've shared this story before, before we wrap things up. I remember when I was still at Watch Fox. I'd only been there for about a year. For whatever reason, Marcus and I, we hit it off, and he trusted me uh, enough to be able to share the story, to break the news in his living room that he was going to come back and work at USC. Um, and I really believe that was the springboard for my career down here in South Carolina. So always, always grateful for Marcus um, and for everything he's done for my career, but I also appreciate the time that he continues to make, not just for me, but for people like you guys, because he knows how much you guys care about him. You know, it doesn't, I, and I'm glad we were able to have him just talk to you guys. You know, it's been a while. Hopefully we'll get the Believe show back up and running soon. But, um, yeah, I mean, he still has plenty of love for Columbia, South Carolina. You guys will have a chance to be able to see him next week. I'll throw that up on Gamecock Central in writing, in, in case anyone wants to make sure that they don't forget that date. But if you missed any of our show today, head on over to the Gamecock Central YouTube page where you can watch this show in its entirety. Or if you're a podcast listener, head on over to the Gamecock Central podcast platform. But shows like today are not possible without our fine sponsors, starting with Liberty Tax. I know it's not tax season quite yet, but it's never too early to start getting a jump start on it. Give Liberty Tax a call to be able to overcome that tax anxiety at 803-462-5576. You can start getting your numbers in order. Make things a little bit easier for you when tax season rolls around. And today's show was also brought to you by our good friend Clint Hammond. See his name at the top of the, every show. He's been a longtime supporter of not just Gamecock Central, but all these GC Live shows. If you're in the process of trying to purchase a home, you're trying to find the best rate on the market, Give Clint a call. That's exactly what Wes Mitchell and his wife did when they 
They were trying to purchase a home as well as Perry Orth and his wife, Shannon. They gave Quinn a call. Do the same. Give him a call at 803-771-6933 and let them know Gamecock Central sent you. All right, boys and girls. That was a fun show today, huh? No, we got a little sidetracked from the game itself, but at the same time, too, anytime Marcus hops on, you want to you wanna talk about some of that other stuff, and it was awesome. Uh, bottom line is this. South Carolina needs to win this weekend. We all know what's at stake these next four weeks if they want to become bowl eligible, but none of that matters if they can't take care of business this weekend. And even though on paper they should be able to do just that, with the injuries, with the inconsistencies, I don't think you can assume anything with this team. However, however, and I don't have my predictions out quite yet, but I'll give you guys a little tease. I will be picking South Carolina this weekend. I will be picking South Carolina to, to win, but they certainly need to go out there and execute in all three phases. It's not just, hey, the defense has to be a little bit better. Oh, the offense got to do that. Special teams needs to hold their own too. And they've done some good things, just like all three units have. They've done some good things at times. Now it's about being able to put it all together. Having good games, all three units, complimentary football. Because as we saw last week, defense did some good things last week. Did some real good things last week early on. But unfortunately, and it's not to make excuses, but when you're dealing with having to play with a, a shorter field, right, as a defense, three series start around midfield because of, uh, two crap punts, and then the kick catch interference. It puts more stress on them, puts more strain on them. Help them out by flipping the field. If you're special teams, offense, do what you got to do, and defense, get your stops. Much easier said than done. Again, appreciate everyone that tuned in today. We will have all this stuff uploaded shortly. We'll also have some additional stories from Marcus Latimer. If you're going to the game this weekend, dress warm. Seems like it might be a little chillier. But that's all right. Enjoy the game this weekend, everybody, and be safe if you're going out tonight or tomorrow.